it's we can just do an, an AS, ASMR. <laughs> Plut okay. Plutocracy ASMR. Welcome, welcome uh, to man. Governance ASMR 101. Um, thanks for tuning in, everybody. I'm I'm really excited about this conversation. Uh, especially excited to have Peter and Dylan here. Um, if you saw an earlier version of the agenda, we had a couple of last minute cancellations, so it's going to be the three of us. But uh, I think that's good because we um, have. I think we. It's safe to say we represent a, a fairly broad array of kind of experiences and perspectives on on governance and blockchain in general. So hopefully we can speak to some interesting things that we're seeing and hearing. Uh, I'm really happy that that last panel talked about um, uh, being sort of devil's advocate so much at the end, because this entire panel is intended to be a, a devil's advocacy panel. Um, so for anyone who, who hasn't gotten the joke, right, we're, we're calling this plutocracy FTW, plutocracy for the win. Um, and so I think the the one game rule here is that you can take whichever side of the debate you want, but you have to argue in favor of democracy, right? It's kind of like saying you can you can drive any car you want, but or sorry, you can have a you, what, what is that? What is the thing they say? You can have any color car you want. It was the yeah. Uh, you're buying has a to be black. You but can, it has you, to be black, right? Yeah. Model T yes, or Ford. The Model yeah. T. Yeah. You can have any feature you want, or you can have any color you want as long as it's black. So yeah. we'll see. We'll see how that works. Um, I guess we'll just kick off with some really quick intros. Peter, do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Yes, tonight I'm drinking Focal Banger by Alchemist. <laughs> Very rare beer. If, if you're into IPAs, it's one of the best from Vermont. And uh, you can actually take it out of the can store now in, in New York because we're in pandemic. But that aside, uh, I'm Peter Morick, Head of Public Affairs at Parity Technologies, helping deliver Polkadot. Uh, I've also done quite a good amount of work in the Ethereum ecosystem. Before I was in the blockchain sp space, I was uh, working at a public affairs strategy firm based here in New York, but with offices all over the United States doing advocacy in almost every industry and every uh, political or social issue you could imagine. So I'm excited to be here to talk about all versions of governance. Awesome. You, yeah, for me. Yeah, so uh, uh, for me, I'm uh, one of the co-founders of Commonwealth Labs. My name is Dylan Chen. Um, prior to that was uh, at UPenn. So I actually have one more class that they were trying to get me to, to finish up um, through some kind of virtual session. I know. Damn, it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's quite a pain, actually. Um, but, uh, you know, been, been largely focused on governance. Uh, Commonwealth Labs, we were uh, focusing on decentralized governance, uh, um, like a, a whole space. Um, a few different kind of products that tie into that common up the interface. Um, so that's a multi-chain governance explorer. You can stake, you can vote, um, you can have long form discussions. Um, so hopefully a little less vitriolic than Twitter, but um, uh, as substantive as some of the debates can, can get. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, with that, we're building Edgeware. So this is actually a, a Polkadot smart contract platform. Um, we were attracted to not, not to shield Polkadot. Um, it, it's certainly having its moment in the sun, but uh, you know, last year we were really attracted to to uh, Substrate specifically, just because it was fully featured from the perspective of governance. Like um, it, from the ground up, you can kind of mix and match. If you wanted, you know, uh, a monarchy, you can have that for your governance system. If you really wanted to have a treasury, you, you could do so. Dictatorship, um, we, we totally of, possible. Right, right, yes. Exactly. Autocracy for the win. There we go. And. Uh, um, so it's been interesting. I mean, you, you know, we can even talk about uh, the potential plutocratic stuff that's has been already going on on Edgeware as it's gone live. Um, you know, we launched in February. Um, we've had a number of proposals go through, had some controversial kind of like community interactions. Um, yeah, lots of whales. Um, it's, it's actually been interesting to see kind of the live play by play. Uh, that's me. Thank you for those lovely introductions. Again, really excited and honored to share the stage with Tell you. Tell us about yourself. Today. Uh, I'm Lane. Yes. Uh, I am a, I don't know, I do a bunch of things. I, I work on a project called Space Mesh. This is our this is our White Rabbit logo for folks who aren't familiar with it. Um, I also do independent research and consulting on governance related things and did a lot of governance related stuff in Ethereum for a while. And so it's near and dear to my heart. Um, Dylan, Peter, I want to come back to uh, sort of what you are both seeing in the governance of your respective platforms in a moment. However, um, I want to also try to do something a little bit different with this panel, 
and that is uh, tie it to the actual real world. I want to kind of try to escape mm -hmm. the crypto bubble a little bit. I want to acknowledge the fact that Dylan, I don't, I don't remember where you are. You move around a lot, but I know Peter and I are both in New York, and I can, I can hear. Uh, Dylan actually outside. lives like what four or five don't blocks away me, from yeah. me, but he, yeah, no dogs, he dogs, ran dogs, home. <laughs> He ran home. I won't say where home is. Yeah, he home. lives yeah. near me in New York City, and he ran home. And I, I, I think home. you and I, I are still home. here. We're here. Surviving. We're here. We're here. And, uh, and surviving. You know, we've been we've been watching, watching, listening to may or may not have been participating in in protests and things the past few days. Uh, but I don't want to. I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to ignore what's going on in the world. And and so uh, I think if if you guys are on board with this, I'd like to talk about. Not, not so much what blockchain can do to fix the world, because I'm not sure we're there yet with blockchain, but maybe the other way around, maybe lessons from what's happening in the real mm -hmm. world and governance for blockchain. So let's get let's get controversial. I'm going to give you guys a question and, and we can I don't have to moderate. We can all kind of have fun here. OK, uh, and the question right. the, the question is the following. Democracy in the default world, what's going on out there? It doesn't seem to be working very well. Is mm -hmm. the answer is the answer plutocracy, you know, would, would the world be better if we moved away from democracy and uh, kind of, I don't know, tried to govern everything right. using using dollars or something instead? Uh, using free. dollars, using dollars. I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a beer. It is happy hour here, so please feel free as well to, to join me in that. But go ahead. And we're we're, we're supposed to play devil's advocate. We, we have to argue for uh, plutocracy in this circumstance. If, if I were to, re like, wave a wand across the whole world and just, like, reinvent it, um, at least, okay, let's, here, here's the grand rule. You have to, uh, yeah. at least try to make a case for plutocracy, but feel free to like bring in other perspectives, obviously. I'm so when you go first, cause I, I have the answer. I have it. You have the answer. Yeah, go okay, ahead. Okay. I studied political science in college, so it's a little unfair for this, but go ahead. Right. Yeah. You're gonna, <laughs> you're, I'm, I'm being hustled over here. Um, let me think. Um, so uh, obviously, I'm I'm not in New York right now, so can't comment directly um, upon like what what's actually happening on the ground. Um, but certainly on Twitter, there's like a bunch of things <laughs> that seem like they're happening. Cars being overturned, st shops being looted, but like a lot of positive energy um, coming from, I guess, people that are that are agitating for change. Um, if I were to argue for plutocracy, how do I do this? I mean, yeah. democracy is not working. <laughs> Do you, right. you agree, agree or disagree? <laughs> wow. And why oh is it? Why, maybe we start with this. Why is it not working? Uh, I mean, so it's not working. Because, let, let, yeah. let me say one more thing. Like there are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people out on the street in this country and many countries making their voices yeah. heard. If right. Maybe let's zoom in a little bit. Yeah. Agree or disagree. If they felt that their voices were being heard already in the existing democratic democratic system, which we have here and, and many of the other countries that are seeing protests, would there be a need for them to be out on the street flipping cars? That's a great question. Um, yeah, no, if, if they're if uh, they were actually able to exercise their voice in the manner that they feel like they could, I don't think this would be happening. I think I mean, in general, like. You know, I think you can actually make a case that we're already in like somewhat of a plutocratic system, right? And so maybe it's like democracy in veneer. Um, you know, it or who who is who like Eric Weinstein, right? Talking about KFAB and how the political system, uh, mainstream media, all these other things could be just like stage managing what we actually see, right? And where where we actually see on Twitter or or these other venues which are independently run, organized, you can actually see like, okay, this is maybe what democracy actually looks like, right? Um, you know, so yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I guess like, I, I, maybe I kind of reject the premise that, um, uh, even that we have like a democracy right now, like that it's actually functioning. And I think, uh, yeah, maybe I should stop there. That, that I don't like a disagree with you, Dylan. Feedback. I don't disagree. Let me drop a little bit of knowledge on you right now. Every system that is built on economics as the driving factor in society, which capitalism is, has some ins inherent form of plutocracy. Democracy has plutocracy built in. It's not like necessarily two separate systems. Currently, we do have a s too much plutocracy in the United States. And I'm telling you all that from experience. I worked in governance in the United States, both the local, state, and federal level, and the power that folks like Facebook or the oil companies 
or the, the, even the big media companies, the big the big media, the CNNs, the the NBCs of the world have in government is outsized based on the amount of money they have, which leads to the amount of influence they have. And mm -hmm. no matter what system you build, if there's money involved and you track uh, some level of people's success and power based on the amount of capital they own, there's going to be some plutocracy in that system. It's unavoidable. What we have to design for is we understand plutocracy is inherent in some level of a capitalist system. I mean, even in a communist system, there's a plutocracy that's involved. Um, but we How have to understand- Hey, Peter, that, that's actually a really interesting point. Would you mind elaborating on that? How, mm -hmm. how does photography factor into communist systems? I will. I will. And, and once I will say that I will finish this point by saying before I move on to that detail that we know that because there is plutocracy in all systems and in our opinion at Polkadot and my opinion personally, having studied political science for quite some time is you'll never remove the plutocracy completely. So what you have to do is game against uh, having a minority number of individuals with the majority of the capital having complete control over the system, mm -hmm. which is why you have to build in voting systems where more direct democracy is available. So this concept of liquid democracy where representatives yep. are actually uh, uh, responsible to voting in the direction that their constituents ask or having di true direct democracy like in Polkadot where you have tokens and that means that you have agency, you have say over what the future outcome of decisions are. Beyond that, you say, okay, so there are whales in every ecosystem. How do you, how do you combat the, the, the issue of like excess plutocracy where a whale can come in at the last minute on a vote and change the decision by a majority and you start to build in things like conviction voting, things like quadratic voting, which we already have implemented in Polkadot, where you can multiply the value, you can multiply the strength of your vote six times in exchange for time locking your tokens for some period of time if you really feel strongly about a issue. So a whale who may have strong economic interest in moving their tokens quickly or some outside party who would otherwise want to come in and buy a lot of tokens, manipulate your vote and then leave, it eliminates a lot of that because you can't really like uh, flip a token, vote and then leave re really quickly if you have to hold on to that token for five months or six months in order to actually have the conviction in your vote. So there are ways, there are mechanisms, there are tools that we can build into voting systems that dampen the inherent plutocracy in economic systems that you will never actually be able to eliminate. And this is coming from an advocacy background where I was helping try to, we, Elaine, you wanted to talk about uh, something current. Like I was heavily involved in reforming the prison systems in New York and like, there's a, there's a lot of interests involved in making that sort of thing happen there. Yes, there's those communities that are being arrested, but then there's also a huge amount of interests on the corrections unions and the political side. And you have to really figure out a way to come to an agreement there. And it's a democracy, New York, the United States, it's democracy, but there are these plutocratic forces at play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm. Um, I actually have. I have a few thoughts there. I mean, you know, there's that one Princeton paper, which is like, if you're uh, basically elite uh, interest groups, whether they be heads of corporations, um, you know, lobbying, uh, you know, money interests, elites, like, um, usually get their bills passed or like views actually passed, um, and interest groups that, um. Uh, you know, may, maybe represent like, uh, we'll say like the ACLU or something like that, right? Where it's more interest-based, more more uh, um, driven by the people, usually don't get their views passed as much, right? And so, yeah, you know, to, to think about the existing systems that we have today um, and like, there's there's that thought. And then with respect to Polkadot, given that we, we, we uh, both have uh, experience with the underlying things there, um, I think the, the thing that, you know, 
that we've been thinking about is like, okay, how do we basically deal with vote buying, whether directly or indirectly? Um, and so even if there, it, this is still just like the same problem um, that, that we're facing across, um, all right, we've designed conviction voting, right? Like um, how, how should we make sure that this person still hasn't been paid like out of band? by this other person, right? So, you know, people have written about dark DAOs, people have written about other things. And so there definitely needs to be like additional techniques that need to be developed. Um, one thing I guess that, I know this is not as, con I guess like con as controversial, right? But like, okay, with that in place, like, and that we, if we know these are the actual constraints, then maybe we should actually hold like an Edgeware conference or like a, a, a Polkadot conference IRL and do the voting in person, right? With actual booths, right? With using a secure voting protocol. So you can still have like a, a QB type system, but like it's literally like a blind ballot, right? Where you're where you're casting it in person at a specific time. Um, Let's yeah. talk about other voting tactics that we can use to uh, sort spy of, votes. Well, no, no, no. We're talking about not spy votes. I'm talking about like harpooning, like not harpooning the whales, but like you know, there's a couple of things. So you've been a part of these a little bit, Dylan, and I've been a part of them too. Several votes where there's basically just like a, a completely unstructured coin vote. I'm thinking about like the mm -hmm. Dow hack vote. I'm talking about the EIP right. 999 vote. I'm talking about the Aragon vote. I'm talking about the, uh, what was the more recent one uh, on another protocol? I, have you the had any re renomination re vote? Well, not as much in that case, but it, because it didn't actually happen in that case, but those previous cases, mm -hmm. You always see, because like, I'll take this back a step. Who here out of the three of us ever bought anything on eBay or tried? You tried to buy something on eBay? I actually haven't. Dylan, come on. How young are you? <laughs> too, too young, apparently. So when you participate in an eBay, eBay auction, like for something you really like and you really want to be sure to get it, you have to use a tool called an auction sniper right? Mm -hmm. Where you just let some other software connect to your eBay account and say, in the last 10 seconds, I'm willing to pay 10% more than the highest bid or my high bid is X and just go $1 over the next highest bid. So we're obviously going to see that kind of same stuff if we have coin voting where somewhere right. with a bajillion tokens in whatever the protocol it may be, is just waiting, waiting, waiting to last minute and, and you know, just going to go one dollar over or one token over the highest or to, to flip the vote, right? So like, yeah. oh, what can we do? It's like, obviously we have tools for this. So it's actually the solution. And I'm talking with us about this in regards to Polkadot's potential. Obviously it's not yet been proposed, but it's something that I'm concerned about and something that we've actually already implemented on the parachain auction side for parachain auctions, because we saw the way it works in eBay, learning from experiences when there's a parachain auction. So for those that don't know what a parachain auction is in order to um, reserve capacity on Polkadot, when it is fully operational, you will either be a parachain, which means that you you, you own a piece of the relay chain for Ethereum people. This is um, similar to the beacon chain. So you, you, you actually own a piece of the capacity on the relay chain. And this is distributed via, via a permissionless auction. So theoretically, you could, or any big whale could, throw the big bid in at the very end and automatically win every pair of chain and just then resell them. But the way we fix for this, because we know that this is the way people interact in uh, auction systems is by saying that this is the voting period for a, a parachain slot. And mm -hmm. the, the voting ends at this point, but when the voting ends, a randomness beacon sort of selects a block between here and here and mm -hmm. awards right. it to the highest bid somewhere in that period randomly mm -hmm. so that you can't auction snipe at the very end and just right. snap up all the parent chain slots. So that's something that you could implement in uh, referenda as well, just to eliminate the, even the idea that me as a super whale could come in at the last single block before the end mm -hmm. of a voting period and say, just exert my power over anyone and never give anyone a chance to respond. So like 
my overall point when people argue against on-chain on -chain governance because of plutocracy and because whales can come in and do this stuff is there's so much we can do to ensure that the, the, the folks, the real people, the users of the, the protocol have uh, really a, a resounding and, and I would say actually representative voice in the overall decision right. and not just give the, give the decisions to the, the whales at the end of the day, because as we've seen in things like the EIP 999 or um, uh, Dow fork, votes like mm -hmm. there were massive whales just come in and just like pile it on and there's nothing anyone can mm -hmm. do so you yeah. put conviction voting together with something like that where the sort of timing of it is less of a critical issue and you actually have something closer to a, a representation of what the body right. politic wants yeah Peter, i mean Peter, would, it be, would, it, would it be accurate to sum up some of what you're saying in the following way tell me if you agree or disagree number one there's no such thing as pure democracy free of plutocracy and number two we can design around a lot of the failings in plutocracy and the ways you're describing yeah. things like fiction voting time locking um quadratic mm -hmm. voting all this kind yes. of stuff absolutely and i can expound on how this can actually benefit our nation state governance later i don't want to get into that quite yet but uh these same principles apply to the way our existing at least especially in the united states also in the uk the way we we look at our governance, it, it it our existing nation state governance can evolve to be better, and I think that mm -hmm. blockchains being a testing ground for the improvement in those governance structures can actually be quite valuable. Yeah, I want to I want to uh, and Edgeware is a perfect to place to try out the stuff because part of the purpose of Commonwealth and Edgeware is to correct me if I'm wrong, Dylan, to like really test the boundaries of, of what's possible. That that's it. That is not a paid advertisement, people. That that was uh, <laughs> he did it himself. Um, I kind of want to I want to get back to. So there's been like a, a, certainly a ton of like interesting economic results, especially around like auctions, right? So, uh, uh, the winner getting like the second bid or paying the second bid's price, um, using a random to speak in stuff like that. I think those are all interesting. But I mean, maybe maybe we're talking around also like the original premise of the question is like. If we're arguing, if, if we're supposed to argue for plutocracy, I mean, there's definitely circumstances where it does work, right? Like, uh, if so if I'm a, can I can I jump yeah. in for a sec? So it's it's funny. Like, I I feel like we've had some version of like probably the some permutation of the three of us and a handful of other people have had some version of this conversation as a panel in many conferences before, um, and. Uh, I'm actually really enjoying this because uh, I think flipping the table a little bit and kind of forcing myself to uh, look at things from the other side and try to argue in yeah. favor of is really a fascinating exercise. Um, but so Dylan, I want to agree with you. And I think the best example here has nothing to do with blockchain. The best example of this is that companies, firms, yep, yep, exactly. 99.9% percent of firms run as plutocracies, which is to say that, you know, the people Web3 who have- is bringing the corporate board into the public. Yeah, there That's you go. Web three is that is it right there. You you nailed it. Web three is Facebook's board that we can all vote on. We can have a Facebook, and the board is the holders of the system. Yeah, I mean this is this is actually a pretty. This is one of the strongest arguments I've ever heard in favor of plutocracy on chain. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If you if you take the, if you take the corporate model, the firm model, and you do nothing more than get shares or tokens into the hands of a whole lot more people, not even yes. a whole lot more people. Okay. The share, the yeah, actual I, share, you have shareholder meetings, right? Think about yes. how fucking bullshit, excuse my French, that shareholder meetings are. A bunch of shareholders come together. Let's say, talk about the Amazon shareholder meeting. And there are a bunch of sycophants saying, oh my God, Jeff Bezos, you just made me a thousand percent the last couple of years. Whatever you do, yeah, yeah. I'm going to do. And you own the board and that's fine. Like we're all going to just follow you. And that's fine. Like, I guess for a lot of Amazon shareholders, but for a lot of Amazon employees, a lot of Amazon sellers, a lot of Amazon customers, yeah. it's not great. And in a Web3 protocol, yes, those people who buy a, some sort of equity into Amazon or whatever the Web3 Amazon is, will have their representative mm -hmm. say, but so will for the sure. factory worker, right? And they could potentially have a conviction vote where you know, if it comes down to like safety on the job, like and a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand Amazon factory workers 
a fulfillment center, excuse me, workers mm -hmm. uh, vote 6x conviction that a, th a, a tenth or an eighth of, of Amazon's uh, budget is going to go to a pension fund for them. Yeah. That'd be fantastic. And I, 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 I won't uh, shit talk Amazon that much considering I think they've really been the leader. They're keeping you in, alive right now. Well, no, but that, that aside, like I'm privileged to be able to order from Amazon and have them come to my door, but the, what they've announced in, in terms of really uh, being on the forefront of protecting their workforce and their supply chain yeah. being the first fully uh, COVID tested supply chain, like that is a yeah. honorable pursuit, but would the population of Amazon users not vote for the same if they had the option? I think yeah. it would be the same uh, well, the outcome. On, on, the, on the case of Amazon, well, actually one other point, I mean, you know, even when we talk about the plutocratic case for, I, I guess, just tech companies in general, um, I mean, they're kind of modeled after uh, old school media companies, right? The New York Times where like families still hold ownership, right? There's, there's that secondary share class where Zuck or Larry and Sergey like still hold ownership. So, you know, in the case that they do get diluted down, they probably still wouldn't sell that. And so to a certain extent, that's less plutocratic, right? Where it's just monetarily based, um, even if they do get diluted down and like, you know, uh, BlackRock or some other fund, like mutual fund slash index fund end up ends up open owning like, you know, a majority of the shares. Um, but, I, you know, I kind of want to get pithy. I remember this tweet. I think it's uh, about Amazon specifically, right? It's uh, 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 in, in the end state of like U.S. capitalism is like Amazon, like the site is like, I mean, Amazon in, internally is socialist, essentially, right? Or, or like, I'll, I'll make that claim. So like everyone, uh, uh, Jeff sets how much you get paid and then like, we'll just reorient like his like state owned economy to like work on this other thing or do this other thing. Right. Um, and so I think even when we're talking about these systems, like a plutocratic system, like a, a, a shareholder, like a corporation itself, um, it also has like flavors of other elements, other types of systems that we actually do interact with every single day. Um, and I mean, even thinking about like, um, it's, I feel like Peter, the, the last point you said has a little bit of flavor for like, um, like the, the German like system, right. Where like, uh, where basically like the workers have a seat on the board, literally, right. Wh whether it's like the union or something there. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, and then in many cases, right. They, for folks who may not be aware, the union is guaranteed a board seat. I think it's very common. In yeah. Germany. Can I hop in right now? Yeah. So I mentioned hop, earlier, in, hop, in. hop in on hop in. Um, it's, uh, I mentioned earlier that I worked for this firm, very involved in, in politics and advocacy in the United States. And the roots of this firm come from uh, United States union advocacy. So I worked for almost every union that you could imagine, uh, labor unions, MTA, the the, the Transportation Worker, Workers Union. I've been with these people, I've been on the streets, I've organized advocacy protests, all the rest. And you're absolutely right that having the workers have a place mm -hmm. in the decision-making for these organizations is critical to the future of a more unified society. And if these systems in the future rely on digital, economic cryptographically secured networks mm -hmm. those unions those workers will actually for the first time have the full financial economic and decision making say of their individual piece in the system more than they've ever had before and obviously yeah. the union can amplify that but literally having that one worker have their one vote actually in the ultimate decision, not just say, this is what I want the union to say, but actually be also be able to tell the representative that if you don't vote on a $15 minimum wage, I'm going to vote against you. And it's very clear to them that like that, that will turn a piece of their constituency against them. That's beyond powerful. That's more powerful than any corporate uh, ad dollars or uh, a fun election campaign fundraising that can be done because if you know that the constituents in your district 
will not vote for you if you do not support things like having workers on the board. You're not going to respond to uh, uh, this, the, the the general like generally corrupt system that we have today. My cat is bawling. One second. <laughs> I don't. I was nice drop. Um, yeah, I was going to say I was, we're, we're we're running short on time. Um, we have about five minutes left, uh, and. Yeah. Uh, I want to circle back. I don't know if Peter, I guess he has his headphones off. Okay, Peter. Virtual conference hey. life. Yeah. Larry yeah, needed to get some are... food. He was very hungry. It's dinner time. <laughs> Cats eat too. Um, okay. So we're, we're down to our last few minutes here. Uh, Peter, you had mentioned a little while ago um, that you didn't want to get into it yet, but I wanted to save a moment at the end to talk about um, tying things back to the real world and again, what's going on out there. Uh, how? So I want to ask both of you this question. Um, how can these ideas, these experiments that we're running, um, again, I, I want to stay away from saying blockchain is going to fix the world because I don't think that blockchain is there yet. But the ideas we're talking about, the experiments we're running, uh, how can they, how can we run those experiments in the real world and have an impact? Yeah, I'm, um, this is something actually, you know, to, to speak a little bit more about Common Health, like we're extremely excited about um, running experiments on. <clears throat> so, you know, we, we have a few like, we, we're building along the full stack, right? So with uh, a, a pair chain on top of Substrate you know, integrated into Polkadot itself, building different types of applications um, that like can actually utilize like the smart contract platform and then the easiest way to like interact with them. So one feature of Edgeware is the treasury. Um, and so one proposal that I would personally like to push is like running like a humanity DAO like experiment where you nominate for a specific cause, like the people that should get some type of like UBI. Right. So if it's for one of these causes, um, it, you know, it, literally like any anything that's happening today, like climate change, um, you know, against police brutality, like you should nominate like leaders and they should you know, be able to get um, some type of sustainable funding based on that. Right. And then for us, it would be backstopped by uh, the Edgeware Treasury itself um, and then run through the interface. Ideally, like, you know, we there's. I think we're actually pretty close in terms of actually being able to like have experiments that touch the real world and not even just experiments, but like actual products, because, um, you know, integrating with Fortmatic, integrating with Ethereum, integrating with uh, Magic, like all the, you know, they give you logins um, and you don't have to link a MetaMask account. Right. And so with that, then you can just like, OK, let's just do the normal like Web2 product stuff, which obviously we know they're world class builders, you know, at Twitter, at, at Facebook that can actually create good experiences. And so all we need to do is borrow that, right? And if the wallet stuff is already there and like we already have like a chain that can actually process transactions really quickly, then you should just continue to spin up experiments um, along that side. So I'm actually really optimistic from that perspective. So yeah. Thanks big for sharing that. Com big fan of Commonwealth. Uh, you can engage in Kusama and Polkadot governance using the Commonwealth governance UI. And if you are a substrate uh, base chain or want to be a substrate base chain, Commonwealth is a really dope pre-built interface that you can use to help manage your community's governance. I'm pretty sure Nier is using it as a mo obviously yeah, Edgeware yeah. and a few others as well. Um, and it's 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 looking to be one of the key uh, gathering places uh, for the the advocacy and communication around Polkadot and Kusama governance, which I'm really excited about. Um, we also have uh, a interface called Poco Assembly, which is developed by Parity Technologies. Um, there's some, some conversation around ensuring that those conversations are interoperable, <laughs> yes. as, as we say. Yes. So having a shared database, so it's in the both places, so people have multiple options where they can have these conversations. But going back to your point, Lane, where it's like, how do we look at the issues that we see in governance today and how do we test out new or maybe not so new but test out like different ideas yeah I, I, I think it's it's inter interesting you're highlighting the word new because a lot of these ideas are not new a lot of They're these ideas new. are like not, hundreds yeah. of years old they've just never been tried at scale before right so um a couple things that I'll point to, um, and there are things that Ethereum community members will be familiar with, and they're all things that we are currently implementing, testing, and using in the live on Polkadot. So one of the big ones that I want everyone to take a look at is the concept of direct democracy or liquid democracy. So this is where I say that when I 
prove the point that plutocracy is always a piece of this whole system. You'll never have a blockchain which has pure civil resistance and everyone can really be truly tied to one identity. So you can do one account, one vote and actually be able to have that. That's a, a little bit of a pie in the sky ideal developed by a couple of folks that didn't really study. They understand computer science, but they didn't really study political and social science, understand how this whole thing works. But the concept of liquid or direct democracy is something that is understood in the meat space political governance world. It's actually being tested a little bit in the United States. There's a really great article in the New Yorker um, in February of this year talking about the future of democracy, democracy, where they talk about a couple of the experiments that are going on around direct democracy or liquid democracy in the United States. But this is basically a concept where you as a constituent of a representative can tell that constituent, and I mentioned this earlier, to vote one way or another on an issue. Uh, to and, tell the representative. And then the representative is basically required yeah. in the system to vote with the decision of their constituency. So you can still have a House and a Senate and have that tricameral model of governance work at the federal level, but the representatives themselves are actually representing what their constituents want. Mm -hmm. That is being currently implemented and tested on Polkadot. You can both have direct agency, meaning you have a piece of control in the decision-making of the network. Agency meaning you, you know that what you're saying or doing will have some even small impact on the overall uh, direction of the network or the community that you're a part of. And you layer on top of that the fact that you can multiply your agency six times for a price, right? You can't necessarily move your tokens for two, three, six months, depending on how convicted you are in your decision. But that's a really powerful thing. And then we talked about this earlier is like, imagine like, you know, people would pay an additional fee to have a little bit more voting power, or people would potentially say, I wouldn't, I'd be willing not to vote in the next election to double the voting power I have in this election because this person is an asshole and I really know they're an asshole and this person is not. So like, I'm literally willing ne not to vote in the next election in order to increase my voting power on this one. This is the idea of conviction voting. On top of that, having liquid democracy, and you really start to understand where it really does actually return power to the people without stagnating governance the way, Lane, I don't think you disagree that Ethereum governance tends to get a little bit stuck up. Stuck up. The, the way Gav defines agency, meaning this control over the future of the system in which you're engaged is it being governable, meaning there's a system of rules to reach a decision and it's upgradable, meaning miners don't get a veto. It's, it's, on the, it's the impetus of those who would change the system, the minority who would change the system to take their community and move it rather than on the impetus of those who would be the majority to sustain their system, which is a reverse of actually how this, th these things should really work. Thank you for that. You're welcome. We, uh, we're about out of time, but Peter, we do have a question for you here in the chat that you might want to speak to. I have lived, oh, so the, the question being, Peter, do, yourself, do you see yourself as living somewhere that's not a meat space? Um, yeah, well, maybe you could interpret that. So I've spent a lot of time in the meat space, and by meat space, I mean like literally on the floors of the New York State Senate trying to like deal with issues and by the non-meat space directly dealing with things like uh, advocacy and uh, education and awareness around the recent uh, dot redenomination vote around uh, uh, polka dot on Kusama. So I actually see myself as being in a really really cool position where I can potentially be a bridge to talking about polka dot and interoperability. Like I can bridge these spaces because I've been in both and experienced both. And I really do want to help actually bring 
uh, an understanding of Web3 blockchain on chain and off chain, you know, I've been there too and understand how that works too. But I, I, I really actually do want to be the bridge of understanding between the two because I've, I hate the word unique, but I have a uh, fairly rare experience of having been in both. I think that is a really fantastic note to end on. I think we should all be bridges between these communities. I think yes. that we, we have a lot in the on-chain world to learn from the off-chain world. I, I'm always- Bridges, not barriers. I'm a big fan. Uh, thank you both for sharing your insights. Uh, this has been super insightful. Uh, thank you to the Masari team for hosting this awesome event. Thank you to everyone who paid attention. Listen, thank you, Christian, for hosting this session. Ah, there's Christian. Cool. Thank you, Christian. No thank you for having us. Glad to have you all. Good way to end the session uh, with some more lively debate.